everyone. This is Joe Armstrong, and this is the uh, March version of the AIX Virtual User Group webinars. I want to thank everybody for coming, for hanging on for a, a couple of minutes while we got set up here. Got a great uh, session here for you today. Um, two people are presenting today. So we have Alan Walsh and Tracy Smith. We're going to talk about power enterprise pools with Alan and Tracy. So Alan and Tracy both come to us from what we call now the Washington System Center. Uh, used to be called ATS, so um, that they're from the ATS group. I still think of them as ATS, but now you'll hear the Washington System Center. And uh, both have been with IBM for a long time. Uh, Alan working on power systems and, and um, AS400 stuff for 25 years. Um, Alan uh, has expertise in HMC and virtualization. Uh, and power firmware management. Uh, Tracy has been with IBM for 30 plus years. I think you're in the upper 30s, aren't you, Tracy? April 3rd and will be 39 years. 39 years, oh my gosh, with IBM. So um, Tracy started uh, in Poughkeepsie, New York on the mainframe. He's worked on various systems, but uh, today, uh, and, and Tracy's worked with a lot of customers as well and been a, a trusted technical advisor for many of them. Uh, both Tracy and, and Alan speak at all kinds of seminars, um, the Executive Briefing Center in Rochester. Both, uh, I'm, I'm lucky to have both of them here in Rochester where I live. Uh, and Tracy is the uh, team lead for the Washington System Center and specializes in the delivery of the latest power systems technologies. So uh, we have both Tracy and Alan here. Uh, We'll be uh, trying to answer questions in the background, but um, with that, I think I'll just hand it over to you, Tracy. I think you're starting and you've got your screen set up there, so take it away. All right, thanks, Joe, and thanks everyone for joining us this morning for this talk. Um, this particular item, as you see, um, <clears throat> I went through and I was trying to do a whole bunch of updates, and I've been meaning to do updates for a while, but I never had an impending event like all of a sudden the bug discussion here. So I built a lot, new a lot of new collateral in here, and really, this has been a journey, so I'll talk about the journey we've been on um, with trying to get this, this whole notion of being able to move resources around very uh, seamlessly. And we're at a, a really, really wonderful place here. And at the end of the slide deck, I'll talk about the 860 firmware and why I think that may be something if you're on Power 8 systems, you might want to uh, get to become more familiar with. But let's just jump to the first slide here, slide, slide two. And really, I believe, you know, I, I was massaging this around um, yesterday and today, and, you know, I, I've changed the wording a little bit. But what I really believe is that first thing about enterprise tools, it really is a powerful foundation for building flexible IT infrastructures. And what I mean by that is not only this ability to virtualize and move workloads now between servers, between data centers, potentially, depending on your some of your uh, infrastructure behind the scenes, but also it allows, it's almost like, I can remember Bill Casey, who's the offering manager back in the days when this was George Gaylord and, and uh, Larry Amy. You know, my feeling is this is almost like a volume purchase agreement or that site license, enterprise license, where we've been looking at clients that have that for software. This is almost like a site license or an enterprise license for your processor and memory activation. So no longer do you have to have a system that you say, System one, I have to go buy so many processors and so much memory activation and and have so many uh, OS license and software. It gives me the ability to say, I look at a group of systems and I say, how much between this group or pool of systems, how much capacity do I need and how much do I want to have in reserve so that if any point in time, you know, whether you're a retailer and it's Black Friday or whether, you know, it's you're doing something with a major event like back to school or maybe it's end of month and you need to move resources or it's disaster recovery. So this is not only a flexible um, hardware type of activation type capability, but also it is a big, uh, big opportunity to save money where you don't have to have all these activations and software licensing. Um, and again, there's a little bit here as we really get into this, because I typically have been, I've been doing this for a lot of years, as we'll see here in a minute. Um, and I kind of try and specialize a lot on the enterprise systems because that's where I've spent my career from the mainframe, you know, all the way through what we've been doing through um, the AS400 and through our power systems unification and today where we're at. And a lot of this stuff, not only do I learn from you guys and what we're trying to implement, 
it helps me to go back because I have lots of discussions with people in the lab of how things actually work and what we really need. So this actually getting to where we're at here, I can remember many, many discussions on getting these managed HMCs that you'll see us talking about. And what we'll do in, in the middle of the presentation or somewhere uh, top of the hour, we'll actually have, uh, I'm going to have uh, Alan just do a demo. So if everything goes right, we'll actually do a demo. And a lot of times we'll sign on and do a, you know, a demo so people can see us moving resources. And we also want you to see this whole thing because lots of discussions on compliance and things like that. But, you know, some people believe this to be a great um, disaster recovery, high availability thing. And it is because I can move these activations around. Um, but we'll talk more about that. So again, um, to me, it really is this, this mobile capacity on demand gives you lots of flexibility. And what happened is, as you'll see here in a second, when I show you the chart that I built, that kind of shows as we've evolved from the days of the 595 and CBUs to where we're at today, um, instead of us controlling those activations, then our customers have to keep coming back to us to move activations this mobile thing's been going on for a while. This is the ability to say we put the keys, those activation key management on an HMC, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this master HMC. But what we're doing is this master HMC or the primary key holder for any given time gives us the flexibility to say, I want to either have my operators move activations around or what's way cool here it's the ability now to have, you know, we work very closely with lab services on this. And so, you know, whether you're using PowerHA or you're using, using live partition mobility for availability, this is the ability to write scripts and actually move the workload and all the process, you know, all of a sudden we move from running on this system one to system two, and we have the ability to write scripts and or automation controls to actually move the processor and potentially memory activations between systems. And this can be done seamlessly. So again, this is a big deal in terms of keeping high availability and keeping workloads up and running. And you'll see when you get these charts some. I also have some uh, descriptions in some of the slides. So this became, you know, one of the things that's happened over time, and I thought this was so important, was um, on our enterprise systems, we have lots of different ways to turn on processors. Not quite as many as, as we do for memory, but there certainly are several different methods. Um, again, so I built this next chart to kind of explain what those look like. And over time, as again, we look at this, you'll see that once upon a time you bought systems and either every, and everything was active, you turned on everything. The challenge was over time that became difficult because especially in enterprise systems, you don't want systems to be down. You want to make sure that you know, this, this world of 24 by seven by 365 that we live in, I have to be able to mask the hardware challenges that I might have of moving workloads or keeping workloads up, whether it's clustering it, whether it's moving the workload to different places, whether it's a data center down, systems maintenance. But what happens is that first row is the static or permanent activations. And the way that this chart was built was so that you could see the type of activation, whether it's always there, whether it's uh, what OS has supported that activation. And then, you know, for the most part, when uh, we talk about firmware, we think about on these particular class machines, we're talking about the Power VM hypervisor, the Power VM firmware stack. And in this case, there were different uh, types of software, you know, uh, whether you did the standard or enterprise. Today in our Power 8s, they come standard with the Power VM Enterprise Edition as part of the, part of the package. Um, and then we look at, you know, what are the supported systems? And I had to update this chart because I wanted to put in, you know, which things are these new class of enterprise systems are cloud models. So you see those in there as well. And then you see firmware levels. And these are the minimal firmware levels. You'll see I build a brand new chart um, later on in the deck because I want you to see that we've made some enhancements in the firmware. So depending on what firmware level you're on, um, especially for this one function we'll talk about called the auto conversion. And then you see kind of when these were announced. So, you know, static, we're gonna show you on screenshots how you can actually tell what type of activations you have on your system. Um, so whether they're static or whether they're trial slash utility, maybe you have some trial, maybe you have some on off um, and the on off capacity, which now has been renamed to elastic. We're working on functions for our cloud connector to the HMC that down maybe in 20, 18, you'll be able to do things like actually 
um, report that through the cloud, a lots of information up to the soft layer. And part of that could be even your what you're doing in terms of on-off capacity and, and different methods there. But today I want to talk mainly about mobile. The other one that's there you see is the IFL, the Integrated Facility for Linux, and how we can also turn on processor memory activations um, for Linux only type workloads on these types of systems. So this chart, and then what I did is in here, you'll see as I always do, um, I've got a link where you can go get, launch that URL down there and get additional information. The next chart here, um, slide number five that we're talking about is this whole idea of how does a system get purchased? And I added another, I did some more wordsmithing on this chart and you'll see I add a little table there to the right and I'll talk about what that table means. But in essence, when you buy a brand new Power 8 system, um, and again, I'm talking about the traditional, because there are differences here when we talk about um, solution versions. Um, an example would be um, the minimum static activations changes. For the most part, static activations for those 780, or 880 and 870 models, it's eight static activations minimum. Now, if you went and bought, like an example, the SAP uh, version, the solution version, it has some different T's and C's, but primarily what I'm referring to here, what I'm gonna stay with is this notion that I have, when I buy one of these systems, I have to have a minimum power eight um, of eight static activations. Now, depending on the system that I have, and at the very end of the slide for reference, I build a table, a couple of tables, so you can see that each of the different system nodes on this class of machine and how many cores are in each of the different types of system nodes. Um, but in essence, that's what I'm referring to as the single node. How many cores are potentially capable of being turned on or lit up on a node, right? Now, what we have here is you have uh, this notion that, again, for our traditional models where there's always eight static, and that's what I'm referring to here. Um, and again, you've got some bullets there. Now, what happens is, let's just say I bought a system and the system that I wanted to buy had eight static activations, and let's just say it had um, eight mobile activations. Well, what would happen is every time we ship a system after it's been ordered through eConfig and AAS, manufacturing pulls down those feature codes, and every one of these enterprise systems gets three codes associated with it. And I'll show you where those codes are later in some slides here about where you find some of the stuff. But you always get a VET code, a mod and a pod. Most of the time, these are all loaded at the factory. But you could always go out and pull these down, and as I put on the slide here, you can enter these through the HMC or through the ASMI. For those of you that wanna see how to do that, if you go look at the uh, slides, um, there's some firmware slides, and may maybe I, I think I told Joe um, in a future couple of months here, I'll do a detailed overview of uh, firmware on these firmware management, and you'll see how I built some slides to try and help show that. But again, so what does a VET code do? The VET code actually is for virtualization enablement technology. That's really when you look on the HMC and you look at the properties and you see true false for things. Let's just say you're an iCustomer and you decided you wanted 5250. That's where you would see the true. One of the, one of the characters in that VET code tells us what things are on, turned on and turned off of that system. Um, then you see a pod code and a mod code. And the pod stands for processor on demand and the M stands for memory on demand. And this is how when a system gets um, sent from the factory, if I go out to the website, I can see the, these three codes for every one of your systems. In this example, um, you can see I just this screen capture. I, I took the serial numbers out to protect the innocent here. So it's a one, two, three serial number, but you can see it was from 2015. Again, this is how these things underneath the covers, how stuff gets turned on. Now, the thing that happens is all these activations, which I put around that bullets down at the bottom, all these activations are, for the most part, specific to a system, to a specific system serial number. The exception here is when we start talking about these mobile activations and a pool of activations, where now I have this ability to have a pool of mobile processor and memory and I can I can assign those to different systems in one two three or more data centers so this would be the exception in this case so as we go forward on the next slide here slide number six 
this whole notion that I believe so firmly in is flexibility, flexibility, flexibility. And that is the big key with uh, doing the, the power enterprise pools. This has been an extremely popular um, technology for our enterprise customers moving into Power 8 class systems. Um, we can do these pools, as you see, we can have different clock speeds in the same pool. But the main thing here is there's two types of pools that we still have. And we have what we call our high-end pool, and we have our mid-range pool, as you see in the center there. And that really kind of, and I'm going to, where we get a little confused on these is what used to happen is prior to the C models, um, we had the 780, you know, the Power 7 Plus 780, the Power 7 795, and we had the Power 8 880. That was a high-end pool. Well, when we announced the um, C models, what we've done now with C models, you can put a C model in either pool. So you could put an 870C with a high-end or with a mid-range. The same thing with a E880C. So you see, um, and this has caused, you know, this is a little bit more confusing, but I tried to put that in there so people can see that. And the other thing we're going to talk about is the flexibility of the HMCs and that bullet up there, and we'll talk more and we'll actually demo that because this is way cool stuff that we've done here. Um, the other thing on this slide is I've got a, Mike Carrera on our team built a really good uh, uh, session or, or um, video file down there on the bottom left, and that really is talking about Power HA and how you can use Power HA with, um, with power, or power Enterprise pools. And the other one is, um, a link, and I think that was from Bob Foster, and it was really what Bob and team does um, whenever they're setting up some of this stuff for the automation, for being able to move resources, um, moving a live partition mobility between two systems, and in this case, also writing scripts to move um, processor and memory activations between them. So this next chart is just a reminder, because a lot of times this has been a real confusing um, thing that we announced way back when. Um, this is something that's having multiple shared processor pools is something prior to when we merged or consolidated P and I together. This was back in the days um, of, this, of the I, the system I back there when we were trying to have multiple different pools. And it really, this was really put in place to try and help us manage licensing. And it's gotten much better with the 840 firmware stream. Um, but the net here becomes what we have to realize is Anytime we turn on processors on one of these machines, any machine, any of these machines, we have what we call the default share pool. It's default pool zero. All processor activations are turned on in that pool. What happens is you may have a mask like share pool one, an example I'm illustrating here, where this share pool might have a limit of four. What that says is any LPARs that I put in there, let's just say I had a machine where I was running AIX and IBM I on the same machine, and I wanted the I, and let's just say my default pool had 12 processors in it, and maybe I licensed AIX to be able to do 12 processors worth. Well, I might not want to buy 12 processors worth of I. So in this case, what we could do is say, I could, I could actually um, say, I'm going to put AIX, or I'm going to put I in share pool one, and I'm going to limit it to being able to only use four of those processors worth of capacity out of the default pool. The thing that people don't, that we get confused here is people think we have multiple share pools on these machines. We don't. We have one share pool. It's the default pool. That's the and all the other share pools are in essence a mask over top. So what I mean by that is if you had several IBM I LPARs and you had them assigned to share pool one, they could in their totality be able to use or consume up to four processors worth of capacity. And depending on how you have the virtual processor set up, that could be across all 12 of those default pools, our default processors in the, the, the processors in the default pool. So the only reason I bring this up, and it's something we work with, and this is where when we talk about doing lab services, it's something we want to make sure when we're moving processors between, if you have implemented share pools for some reason, what will happen is we'll bring the mobile activations in. Well, you know, let's just say I had a system where we had 12, as I was saying, and I wanted to bring in four more, all of a sudden the default pool grows to 16, and maybe you wanted those extra capacity for this, the LPARs running that you had assigned to share pool one. Well, we got to increment that share pool. 
And these are just some of the technical details. I'm going to try and come back up from that. But these are things that we work with, you, with our, our customers as we're going through these, this level of detail here. Um, again, the other, the other thing um, here is, uh, well, let me just jump to the next slide. So as we look, this is the chart I was referring to earlier. And this is kind of the, the evolution of how we've gotten to where we're at here today. So this evolution is really um, from the days of when we had started doing CBU type capacity backup systems. Um, the whole idea behind this was trying to get a system out there that wasn't a full installed system that had all the full cost. It was a lower cost solution so we could do high availability, having multiple systems to move our workloads. And then as we got into the Power 7, 795, we introduced something called PowerFlex, which was again was a next step towards saying, and I've got backup slides just for reference on each of these. The Power this PowerFlex was the ability to buy two systems and be able to share processors between two systems, but there were some terms and conditions of how often you could do that and how you would do mobile activations between systems. And we went from PowerFlex to system pools in 2012, and then from system pools to enterprise pools. And the enterprise pools, and these are lots of discussions with, you know, how our customers want to use this, how does the offering need to, what does the offering need to be, and um, as we got into that that notion of system pools and into into these enterprise pools, one of the things was this notion of having how do we control this ability to have a an HMC manage the keys, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So in 2013, you know, as we introduced the Power 8 systems in 2014, we started seeing um, well in 2013 is when we introduced the Power 7 Plus models. Right, and that's actually the the minimum. So on a 780 and 770, 780D models, the, the plus models, they could be part of a pool or a 795. Right, that was the first introduction uh, introduction to Power Enterprise pools, and then we've evolved quite a bit. And now I just kind of put this up there in 2017 as really high end pools and mid range pools. And again, the slide before showed us what classes of machines could be added there. And I just put a bullet in there that notice. In 2016 was when we added those cloud models. But again, lots of cool things, and this is kind of that history. And again, I put some links down along the bottom if you want to go look at some past history here, that'll help you. And then this next chart, um, oh no, not a good sign. So I'm going to talk about this next chart, and it looks like I may, it looks like power. PowerPoint just died on me, so I might be losing it and have to restart PowerPoint here. But um, what this next slide is about is also the evolution between um, the evolution between these these um, these these different offerings. So you had the CBU for DR and you know kind of what systems they included and kind of what it could do. Then we got into PowerFlex. You know, and then we got into these pools, as I said, and then we got the enterprise pools. Well, I was reviewing this chart this morning, and it dawned on me when I built this thing and updated, I said, by the same HMC, because when we had a master HMC, you had to have the master HMC um, prior to the 885 HMC had to be connected to all the service processors. Now that we no longer have that requirement, um, we have quite a bountiful amount of pool size. So right now, our pool size, um, I would say that the pool size, um, uh, we've tested it to a certain capacity. We've got some customers out there that I know are running quite a few systems on them. Um, but, you know, in my earlier conversation with one of the developers here this morning, I said, you know, I, I put this in here and I'm like, this needs to change because so it's no longer, we really don't have a limit. The limit probably more is in network performance between systems, potentially data centers. Um, but the flexibility is way cool here. So I'm going to try and advance and see if PowerPoint dies. So if it does, just give me a minute. I'm going to have to restart it. Yeah, restart this program. So, um, Alan, do you have that? Oh, wait a minute. It's coming back pretty fast. Okay. Yeah, so we see your waterfalls again there, Tracy. Yeah. All right. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Back. Looks like it's good again. I had nine. Yeah. Where you left. There you go. I had to, yeah. So I just had to uh, restart her there. Sorry about that, folks. Okay, the good news is it recovered pretty fast. So these next several charts are for your reference. This is kind of back in the day, a little more details on what PowerFlex was, a little more examples of PowerFlex and what it did. Um, in this class, a machine. And then we got into system pools, as I said, and this is a little more reference on system pools and what it offered. 
And then we got into these enterprise tools. So slide 13 here kind of shows, and I, mean, I know this is one that Mark Olson built. Um, I think, I don't know who, if Mark built it or someone else built it, Mark just grabbed it, but I grabbed it from Mark and I've kind of, I've altered it a little bit because I really, what, what I wanted you to see was, you know, in a given pool, here's four systems and, and the color coding down at the bottom kind of says dark. A dark processor is just one that doesn't have an activation. So it's installed, but not being used. Okay, static are static or active permanent. Those are activations that the system always has. And then we have mobile. And this mobile is like in system A might have 40 mobile, system B. So between all four systems in this pool, and these four systems could be in the same data center. They could be spread between two, three. You know, you put them in different data centers. We'll talk about a little bit about how do we architect some of that stuff. Um, but what happens here is I got 160 mobile activations. Let's just say when I click the button here, I want to move some activation. So you can see in this case, I'm showing you the original down there in the bottom left. I had 10 static and I had 40 mobile. What I did, either through automation, through a script um, or automation, or I had an operator sit and say, I want to move some activations around. I move 40 mobile um, from system A, and you can see I moved 15 of those to system B and 25 of those to system C. And when you see us demo this, because a lot of times, you know, people will see this and say, wow, how long does it take? You'll be shocked at how fast this is. I mean, it is instantaneous. Processors are very, very fast. Memory activations are very fast at the system where the activation starts to come into perhaps some slowdown is by the LPAR consuming the memory. And, and the LPAR is for processors, by the way. They consume processors. They can take processors not on and off pretty fast. Um, but again, there's some more discussion there. Because sometimes if you're using all the processors and you try and take them away and you're using them, I can't, I won't take them away, but I do know that now you wanted me to. So we're going to talk a little bit about how that works with a topic called compliance. But this is really cool technology. And in the, one of the latter, um, screens I have on 840, there are some tremendous enhancements for memory, um, DL paring memory, because really what we're using here is the, the dynamic LPAR to move memory, take memory away from an LPAR. It's the same, same code that was used, but in the 860 firmware screen, they enhance that capability to extreme levels. And I'm going to give you some charts in the back here just to show you that, um, what's there. So the next chart here, what I built this chart for is mainly a discussion point because there's a lot of times where people aren't quite sure how processors get turned on. So in this case, you can see I have a 32 node system and all our 32 core system node, I should say. And if you turned on 16 activations, the hypervisor will determine how to turn those 16 on. He could turn on, you know, he could turn on four per, per, per um, module. He might turn on he might turn on eight on one module. It really has to do with the hypervisor looking at how do I turn on cores to give you the best affinity for your LPARs. So this is just that example that, you know, unless we do some drill downs with things like Power, Power VP to try and see where activations are actually, what cores are lit up, the hypervisor does all of this as part of its virtualization and trying to give you the optimal con processor and memory config um, for your for your uh, LPAR definitions. And the same thing goes here with the second one that's just about mobile activations. Again, those mobile activations can be turned on anywhere. Um, and there's there's things that we've done to trick the system out and to try and do things like I might start an LPAR. Let's just say I wanted a certain LPAR to live on one node. I might start that LPAR up and it might be a shared virtual. I might start it with 32 cores worth of capacity and then the LPAR 8 off. The reason why is now the hypervisor remembers that. So if ever I come back and want more cores, it's going to try and light those cores up right on the same node where it, where it originally had those. And this is a deeper discussion about some of those things. And this is where Steve Mississippi on our team, we would have this discussion and start talking about that tool, um, power, power of VP and some of how that does and, you know, our affinity and things like that that we can do in, in AIX and DSO, um, ASO, DSO discussions. Um, but anyway, moving past this. So all I put here was, uh, we talked a bit about processors. This is about memory. And the other thing here, memory works just like processors. And you heard me talking a little bit about performance. Um, 
The other thing that happens here is you have to have a certain amount of license. So for IBM System Group license, so if you have PowerVM, you have uh, IBM I, you have AIX, what we would say is if you had a pool um, like that example where we had earlier, um, you know, if I went back a couple slides here and said, try and go back a couple slides here. This one, if I said I had 160 mobile activations, well, somehow on those activations, I have processor, or I have a OS license, and I have Power VM license, and I have Power HA. I've licensed those activations across those four systems. It's just that I have the ability now to move those between systems. So as I move a processor, I'm also moving the activation and the software entitlements with that. Okay. Um, so let's see. The other thing that this chart tells us here on slide 17 is really not only do we have mobile, but you still also have the elastic or on-off capacity too. So it's not that you can only use one of those from that table I showed you earlier. You have the ability to use, you know, you can do trial, you can do on-off, you can use mobile, you can do them all together. You can use any of them or you can use all of them. You can use IFLs with these. So really, um. There's, there's lots of different flexibility here, and we'll talk and show you some screenshots on the HMC of how you know how your cores are actually lit up. So how do I order? This I'm going to go through pretty quick, but I know we have some sellers always on the call. And this is kind of um, partly for you, the client, to know what goes on, as well as the order takers to know. I built this because there was a lot of confusion around how to order these. So I've got step-by-step step here that says these are the feature codes that we use. Um, as you can see um, down there, I say that the firmware was the 780 firmware stream. Um, this is what we were talking about on the Power 7 Pluses or the 795. These were the feature codes that we introduced to be able to specify mobile activations for memory and mobile activations for processor. Um, again, notice that the memory is in increments of um, the activations are increments of 100 gigabytes. Um, and again, um, probably good enough for here just to give you that information. Now the next screen here is what's the minimum. I talked about that over to the right being for the 870 and 880 class machine where it's eight and you can see the memory activations. I also have in this table, you know, what you'd need if you were using um, uh, Power 7 Pluses or the 795. Um, again, again, um, what are the other things let me think about here, let's see. Uh, the, the other rules apply here. These rules are set in place, but the order takers know that there sometimes are some RPQs out there to uh, change some of those characteristics of how much memory is active, has to be active on the system. Enough said about that. But this, again, is more of a reference table for the order takers, uh, configuration people. And here are the steps. <coughs> and I've I, I've been working on this thing. I always tweak it from time to time. It looks like I have a little bit off the screen there. But um, I'm going to talk. Oh, yeah, don't worry about what's over there on the left. That was actually a remnant of something I was working on last night. I need to delete that off of there, that little firmware. Um, but anyway, notice the five steps. When someone orders a brand new system, this is a critical thing that happens. What, what happened is when we introduced power enterprise uh, power enterprise pools, we already had announced the system. So that systems are out there. So we could convert static activations or dark activations to mobile. Well, what do we do when we're gonna introduce the Power 8 back in the days when we were planning on the Power 8 and we knew we wanted to have this capability? How do we ship the system with mobile activations? Because part of creating mobile activation is the client has to have a machine type model serial number for us to add it. And when you order it, we didn't have that because it wasn't it wasn't so. And the customer doesn't want to say, "Let me buy this system and then let me then let me come back." And now somebody wants to sell you. I sell you eight eight static, and now let me sell you eight mobile. And you have multiple bills. You want to do it all in one configuration, one one price. So what we had to do was we created something called mobile enabled. If we had it to do over again, I would have lobbied strongly to call those mobile enabled static processors because what happens is a lot of people when they order the system believe that they order a system with eight static and eight mobile enabled they thought they had 
eight static and eight mobile. No, the way the system ships and arrives, when you set that system up, it has 16 static processors turned on in the default share pool. Okay, and the only way that you can really truly convert those to mobile is to actually go through the rest of the step. So mobile enabled feature codes will ship, as I say, initially it's static, and at that point there is no XML file. So this is where we start at. And two is the steps that now the sales group works with the client to say after these systems have shipped and we have serial numbers, now we have to build a contract. The contract is actually an addendum to say, what are the systems that I'm putting in this pool? So if I put two systems in the pool and both of those were eight static and eight mobile enabled, those configurations are there. And what has to happen is I say, these are the systems that I want. And then I have to order, do an order to convert those mobile enabled to true mobile processors. And that's what step three is. And I'm gonna show you through screenshots, the next several just explains that. Then after we've done all of that, uh, ordered those features, and it's important to order not only the EB35 feature codes that says I want this pool, this system being part of a pool, but if that system is contributing mobile enabled processors or converted static processors, someone has to order that so that when we go look at those records, we know this system is part of the, part of the uh, pool as per the contract, and I read how many mobile processor memory activations and I tally those all up to create the pool in the XML file. And so that's that's how the X that's how we build the XML file. Then you go download the XML file and um, now you have a, a, an enterprise pool. Um, down in here, then and then five has changed. I'm gonna talk uh, show you some slides on five and how this whole new thing called uh, automatic conversion. But again, this is more for those of you that are sellers on the phone or technical support. If you need me to drill down and do a deeper discussion on this, let Joe know or let me know, and we'll try and set up some, another session where we go into more details. But again, I put this in here because this kind of shows to you as order takers or those that are sitting in front of eConfig. Here's an example of how you'd order the new system. You can see the, the activations in this case that I have down there, and I have a you know, eight static, as I said, and you can see I've got eight mobile enabled. Um, and then as I go forward, you can see the feature codes. The big thing is when I convert from mobile enabled to true mobile, um, it's a zero price MES. So then we get into this next thing about the contract, you know, and again, I have examples of contract, but this just highlights that that needs to happen. Step three then says, now I've done the contract, I've specified what systems are in my pool, and now what happens is I go in and process the eConfig, and this is an example of an MES to add EB35, I want this particular system as part of a pool, and you know, down, down below you can see my additions for activations, the add and delete of activations to remove the mobile enable to true mobile activations. Okay, and the next slide shows you then the XML file. So at that point, all of a sudden, here we see our screenshot, and here's a, a link if you guys want to go find where this, where your COD codes are at and where the XML file can be downloaded from. You go to this URL, and from here I could say, oh, let me go look, and this is where I typically work with account team saying, let's go do a download. I specify my machine type model, and I can see the XML file's been built. And now I can go download, and later on, after the demo, I'm going to go through some details on how to read the XML file. <clears throat> so in this case, step five, if we don't have the automation, and I'm going to show you in a second what gives you the automation on the, on the next slide, we used to have to do this before we got this true uh, automatic. So what automatic conversion does for us, as soon as you do that process, I get an XML file and I actually add a couple lines into the XML file. And as soon as you load that XML file, I auto convert on the fly any cores that you had that were mobile enabled. I convert them on the fly from mobile enabled to true mobile and we're done. Prior to that, it's a much more, there's a much more laborious step here about how to go in order. Now I have to, if I don't have the auto, now I have to go do 
um, I have to go work with the project office, the COD project office, to um, create these R proxies, remove memory and remove processor, and then I have to spend some time to actually uh, go through entering these commands. That's where you see here where I've outlined. Um, you might see a couple of extra lines on your COD site where it's the RMEM and the RPROC. Again, I don't want to go into those details here, but if that's a situation that someone has, we certainly work with the account teams to go through that. The next slide is a brand new slide I was hammering through um, last night, finishing this slide. But this is the auto conversion. And what I did on the right was give you an example of how you would order this. Now, notice what I say here. Auto conversion requires that the system must be at a minimum firmware and HMC level. Okay, so the minimum HMC level, as you can see, is the 884 HMC to do auto conversion. If I have a system that has these levels of firmware, so if I'm one of the, when we first introduced the 870 and 880, the minimum firmware was 820. So if you get the service pack five, which was delivered on September 2016, if that's the firmware level you have, you can have someone process the order then with this, this EME0, which is how I would say I want to do an auto conversion of memory, or the EPE0 to do auto conversion of processor. So again, this chart is here for reference. Um, but this is kind of uh, with auto conversion. I was, what I was surprised, I was working with an account last week or two weeks ago, and Stan, thanks, you're on the phone. Um, I didn't realize that we had actually come out with these newer service packs that actually included this. So they, they, they hadn't talked to the asset manager for a while over in Hypervisor here. But I put this together because this is the way it is. So this auto conversion, highly recommended. If I was going to do a Power Enterprise pool today, I would want you on 885 or 886 HMC with one of these levels of firmware. Because it just makes life so much easier. And then this just says, if you have a 795, another thing that has to happen with these is, um, if you had a 795 in your pool and you eventually want to take, remove that 795, we actually have to also do a, a part of the license agreement I had earlier was, was either for new, add, or remove. Anytime you want to add a system or remove a system, we need to process a license part, update that license agreement. And what happens with that license agreement when we do that, um, it's actually helping us to know we have to do something different on an XML. So in an XML file, we'd actually, if you said I'm removing the 795, it would create a new XML file that would have removed the 795. Now, before you do that, we would want to take those mobile activations that might be part of that. If you're moving those mobile activations and the software license, in essence, what I call re-anchoring them to one of your 880s, this is the process we would follow to do that. Again, this is more process than it is how the Power Enterprise pool, but I just included here as a quick spin through. Because really what I want to get to now is managing and talking about the HMC. And this is kind of prior to the 885 HMC is what we're going to see these next few slides. Um, so if, if you have this situation, and, or if you've talked to us prior and you heard this, this is the way it used to be. I used to have to have a master HMC, and that master HMC had to be connected to every one of the service processors on, so if I was trying to span across two data centers, that HMC, I had to have span across both the connection for that master had to be spread across and connected to every one of the service processors, both the local data center and the remote. And you'll see in a, the next slide here that I put together, it's just kind of what that looks like. Um, so again, this was the way, and this was a limitation that we had, because what in essence happens is anytime you want to give somebody a mobile activation, in essence, we're going to the master that has all your capacity on demand keys, and we're giving keys out to various systems to turn processors on and off. So you have a certain amount of processor capacity. We can now move that throughout the enterprise, as I described earlier. And this is some of those details around that. And so we have this, we still have a master HMC as we'll talk about, but it's actually been enhanced quite a bit. And with the managing HMCs, um, the flexibility is very, very, very um, flexible. So this is an example of, you know, a, a picture that says, hey, if, if I had this system, the master HMC as I was showing had to be connected to every service processor. And then if I wanted to have um, a backup of master HMC, 
I'd have to have that one connected. So if you were spanning two data centers, this is where it got to be challenging. Um, how do I implement that? So this is kind of talking a high level picture. This is a more detailed picture that we created to explain this. So, so what, what happened was, um, and this one I took out a bunch of slides, but this one is the example of with the 885 code and the managed HMCs. Now what we have the ability to do is I can have, and, and how do I become the master HMC? Well, by default, whoever creates, whatever HMC I create the pool on, that is how we first establish the master HMC. The master HMC, as you can see in Alan will demo here in a minute, we can move that between uh, HMCs, whether they're physical HMCs or, or virtual HMCs, you'll see we'll be able to move the activations work. Are the, who's the master? We can move it around any time. If my current master died, HMC died, I can just say on another one of them, maybe uh, HMC1 uh, went belly up. So I could go over to HMC2 and say, hey, I want to take over as master. What happens is master is the only one that has edit authority. So all the other managing HMCs have to talk to the master to give and take resources. So we only have one master at a time, all right? And so this is part, and you know, we get into lots of scenarios where people say, well, what happens if that system went down? What happens if that network went down? What happens if that data center went down? Um, so again, there's lots of different things that can happen here. This is a high level. What All we need, instead of having, I took out the slides, I probably should have had one more slide in here. Prior to this, what we had to do, especially with set sides in the, in the infrastructure, was we had to span the subnet mask, we had to span the network across multiple. Um, and it's not so bad in a data center, but when you're trying to span a network across the, um, multiple data centers, most clients don't, don't, won't authorize that. So this is something we've been working on, as I said, in architecting. I've been working with George Gaylord and, and Larry Amy um, and then Bill Casey on this because they didn't understand this limitation, but we actually, you know, really uh, finally, you know, multiple times I was writing on napkins and papers showing George and I actually built them some slides. And we re-architected, re-engineered this so that now you have this very, very flexible HMC infrastructure. And the only thing you need between the HMCs is the RMC connection, and Alan will talk more about that because, you know, what I do is I'm looking over this stuff, and then I work with Alan a lot because I'm on all kinds of different projects, and Alan becomes my backup on a lot of this stuff. And over time, we, you know, when Alan and I used to do the HMC together, he now is our HMC focal. And, you know, I, I typically try and catch up with him and do firmware with him. And I, but again, I get into lots of places, uh, like the area I'm most concentrated on now and being pulled into is a lot of the Linux and the open source stuff. But again, we'll talk a little bit more about this. So this, this is, I asked Alan, I said, you know, Alan, we get lots of questions here. What we really need to do is build a chart that really has, you know, how do you do this, you know, what do you, what ports do you need to open up on the firewall? How do you connect all this stuff? What are the network infrastructure details? So I said, Alan, you need to build this chart. And Alan will tell you, I've probably told him that about six times. Alan built the chart. Here it is. It's very, I mean, it's a, it's a lot to chew on here, but it, we use it. Alan uses it whenever we're helping clients really understand how to do this with their HMCs, how to actually implement and architect this. So this is a, Alan, kudos for building the slide. And this next slide is another one I asked Alan to build, which was, you know, when we did the 885, you know, give me a chart that says, you know, what are your, because he, he typically pitches HMC at the tech conferences. So give me a slide of the highlights for 885. And what you'll know when we talk about firmware is we did not have an 850 firmware release. We had an 850 release but it only was the 885 HMC. There was no firmware, system firmware that went with that release. And we really needed this enhancement for the Power Enterprise pool to get that flexibility in these managed HMCs. So that was a major function as well as the, uh, as he as specified in here, the remote restart. Um, so he put that in here as well. And again, we go into those details, but Alan knows I've been chasing him for an 886 slide because uh, I was presenting this somewhere uh, a couple weeks ago, and it was like we need an 886 to kind of give them that as well. And I have a slide, like I said, in the back on the 886 firmware that we'll talk a little bit about. So this is actually the 885. This is 
on the left, you're going to see Alan demoing this, so hopefully, Alan, you're about ready, buddy. Um, oh, yeah. What you'll see here is, okay, so you'll see in a minute here, um, typically, I'm glad Alan's here to demo it because it's enough trying to put slides together, but um, we've been working on this, tag teaming on this for a while, but on the left, what you'll see is your pools, and you see we have one, we still call ourselves ATS. This was the initial pool I set up first when we first started doing this. And Bob, Bob the Schuster man on the team helped me with building some codes so that we could actually do this. But it was so that we could do a demo between our 780 and our 880 and show how we, we could move resources. So you'll see, and I'm sure Alan will talk a little bit more about the processor memory and the pool definitions. But this is actually a click on managed HMCs. This was something that was added at the 885. And this just shows our HMCs, but I think what's important here is I'm going to switch and Alan's going to grab the screen, and he's actually going to do a live demo for you. So at this point in time, what you'll see is there's a bunch of slides that we have in here just in case the demo, in case we lose connection or have a problem. You know, you always have to have that B plan. So the next several set of slides are actually, you know, what we're about to show you. So Alan, take it over. And uh, thank you, Sorry. Tracy. And uh, Joe, are you able to see the, my screen? Yeah, yeah. So you're the presenter. I can see your screen there, Alan, holding the big flag and the twins. Wow. Yeah, that was right. about day. So um, the next 12 slides in the chart deck that uh, Joe shared with everyone are some screenshots that will be very similar to what I'll try to demo here. Um, so as Tracy left off, um, where he left off, I, I've I've launched three different HMC sessions here just so I can kind of bounce back and forth and show you the flexibility of going from one HMC, doing the management to another. And I've got a couple of them in uh, the enhanced mode and this last one's in the classic mode. And I, I always take this option to uh, let people know if you're using the classic mode today, as most of you probably are, be aware that classic mode is going to be sunsetted with the next version release of HMC that comes out. So you're gonna to wanna to start getting more accustomed to the enhanced plus mode uh, going forward. But for the And we of, are planning a webinar on the enhanced mode. So uh, we'll kind of be covering that pretty soon and, and show a little bit of that to everyone. So, um, so I wanna just start out here. Tracy mentioned that there's a variety of different um, mobile or COD capabilities. So I'm going to be using one of the systems in our pool, which is the E880. And if I was to take a quick look there under the uh, processor view capacity settings, it can tell me that I currently am not using any of the COD capabilities. Um, mobile COD is the one that we're going to be demoing. It shows that it's currently not running. It uh, doesn't mean it's disabled or anything. It just means that it's not currently in use. Um, so with that said, let's go back to uh, um, if I go into my Power Enterprise pools, I'm currently on, if you can see at the top of this panel here, I'm on a virtual HMC, ATS V HMC 5. And how do I know it's a virtual HMC? I could uh, easily show you that by just going back to the welcome screen. You'll notice that machine type model, serial number, these are generated because it doesn't have a physical machine type that it's tied to. And I chose this only because I want to show that virtual HMCs can do everything that a physical HMC can do as well. If I was to look at my Power Enterprise pools from here, Tracy already showed you a couple of these slides. Um, so um, you can notice here that if I expand out the pool, Tracy will step you through how the actual pool gets created. I can look at current processor allocation. So um, the two servers that I have in the systems, I have a total of eight mobile processors in my pool. Um, so I have the ability to move some processor activations between these. Uh, these happen to be 32 core systems with 28 static activations on each one. So the most I could move into any one of these servers is four cores, which would max out my 32 core installed capability. If I go and look at uh, managing HMCs, Tracy showed you this slide. And I'd like to emphasize the one I'm on right now is the one here at the top, HMC. Uh, the HMC5, and it is managing one of the servers, the E880. Um, you'll notice that it shows a connected status. What that means is that it is talking to the master HMC. Um, from here, I can also see what is my current master HMC. It happens to be ATS HMC4, which is one of the other 
uh, HMCs that I'll be demoing for you. Uh, and I also like to point out I have an HMC that I added to the pool. This HMC doesn't show, HMC3 doesn't show any servers being managed. It does manage servers, but the servers that it manages are not part of the pool. But because I've added it to the managing HMCs within this pool, I could do anything I want to do from this HMC. For example, um, how easy is it for me to just change the master? I could say, make this HMC3 be the new master. Do I really want to do that? Yes, I can. What it's going out to is it's going to negotiate with all the other HMCs in the pool, um, and they will come back and say, we agree, you are now the master. So now HMC3 is the owner of all those entitlement management. And you'll notice that my connected status changed. HMC4, which was previously the master, is now showing connected because I just made HMC3 my master. So that's kind of a neat thing to show. Um, what I'm going to be actually working on is uh, uh, ATS uh, E880A. So let's go over to this system. So my HMC4 actually manages both of the servers in this pool. If I wanted to look at um, my, property, <clears throat> my properties for the E880, um, I want to look at my, uh, my processor capacity right now. So if I go and look at my processor capacity, it shows I have 32 installed. 28 are configurable. So I mean, I have 28 cores turned on. Um, I have 27 of those 28 cores already assigned to partition, so I have one, one core available. Well, what if I have a need to uh, activate additional processors on this system? Um, so for example, I've got a partition here. I'm about to run um, uh, month end, and I want to have some additional processors. If I was to look at him today, at this moment, and look at his uh, properties, I can see that he currently has 15 cores allocated. I want to take him up to 20 cores. I need, I need all 20 cores to do my month end processing. If I was to try to do that in this state right now, it would only give me one more core because I only have one core eligible to be assigned to this partition. So I want to, I want to make that uh, possible for me to add five more cores to this partition. How can I do that? I can go into any of the HMCs, go to my enterprise pools, and I'm going to look at the processors. So Tracy showed you this screen already. And he says, um, I've got eight total available to use. So I have the ability to um, reassign up to eight cores to the various servers within my pool. Because I need additional cores here on my E880, I'm going to come over here and edit. Remember, I just took master away from this HMC4. HMC3 happens to be my master. That doesn't come into play here. As long as HMC4 can talk to the master, He's going to have edit authority for any of the servers in the pool. Um, and I'm going to say, let's bump him up by four. So I'm going to activate the remaining four cores on that 32-core uh, system. And if I say save, we're going to see a couple things happen. It's updating the pool property, so it's in, informing all the other HMCs of its request to do this action. Confirmation from the current master HMC says, yep, you're okay to do that. And you can now see that I have an additional four cores of mobile activations on this system. So I have reduced my available core count from eight down to four, so I could still have four more cores to move around elsewhere. But if I was to go back now and look at uh, my E880 uh, properties, so if I was to come back into, uh, let's see, which system was I on when I did that? Okay, so I need to get back to one of the servers that manage my E880, so that E880 this is one that does. So if I go and look at uh, my E880 now, and if I look at my uh, server properties, we're going to see that where I had, where I had uh, 32 installed with 28 active before, now I should so see 32 installed, um, configurable 32. So all 32 cores are available for me to uh, allocate to a partition. So now I've got those cores available, so I'm going to go back to my client partition. Uh, Tracy said PowerHA um, for AIX has some automation built into doing these uh, 
reassignments of mobile cars within power within power enterprise pools. Uh, Lab Services has a offering for doing this for IBMI with Power HA or doing it with Live Partition Mobility. So they can script all this that I'm doing as part of this demo. They can automate that for you uh, through their tools. So I'm going to go into my partitions now on the E880. The partition that needed those extra cores um, is this I089, and I'm going to do a DL par operation, um, which uh, shows up a little bit differently when you're in the uh, new mode. So what I'm going to do is uh, just double click on that partition, brings up my uh, capacity over here. So under general properties, if I go into processors, I'm going to now change my allocated cores from 15. I'm going to change it to 20. And I do a save operation. And what that's going to do is change that now I have 20 cores allocated to this partition. So I could do my month end processing now. Um, if I go back and look at, uh, at my running partitions again, as you know, you can go back and forth between different views here. This is the uh, graphic view. This is the text view. Um, this is kind of an HMC thing, but if you wanted to see which, uh, if these partitions are virtual under my BIO servers, I can pull that up and show you that as well from here. So I can see which partitions are being hosted by which BIO servers and what's actually being hosted. But uh, for the sake of this argument, I just want to go back and prove that my uh, partition that I just allocated an additional five cores to um, should show up that I have uh, 20 cores now. Oops, I wanted to hit that one. And it should come back and show that I have 20 cores. This is uh, misbehaving for some reason. Let's go uh, look at my server properties just to, uh, to show that in general. If I go to my processors, you can see I've allocated all 32 cores. I have no additional cores. So those five cores that I had as configurable are all now assigned to that partition. Now what happens if I, uh, I'm ready to give those cores back? So I go back to my Power Enterprise pools. Again, from any HMC in the, in the system here. Um, let's go over to uh, which system am I on? I'm on HMC3. So this HMC is the current master. Um, it does not have any direct control over 780 or 880, it doesn't talk to it at all. But from a pool enterprise, from a power enterprise pool perspective, if I go up here <clears throat> and I say I want to give these uh, four cores back to the pool. So I'm going to say take those four cores, I'm going to give them back to the pool. And it will give them back to the pool. But what's going to happen is the four cores that I'm attempting to return to the pool are still allocated to uh, at that running partition. So you'll see I have a message up here, compliance status, approaching out of compliance within server grace period. The reason it's doing that is because I just took away um, four core allocations that I assigned from the pool, gave them back to the pool, but the server that I gave them to still is using them. So that is a, uh, a situation where we expect you to rectify that. Uh, you cannot continue to run. If, if I were to do this with all of my mobile cores, I would hit a point where it wouldn't allow me to do any more uh, core mo mobile core movement until I rectify that situation. So how do I rectify don't, that? Don't, don't hang on. Don't run away. Notice over there. Point out the unreturned. That's uh, yes. That's what that's about. I need to make my screen bigger. So we and can my, see it. My screenshots did have this. So on return, you notice that I see four on return. But what I also thought it was interesting is I currently have three HMCs that I'm monitoring, that I'm logged into. Every HMC in the pool will get these notification messages. So not only the one I'm working on, but every HMC, because they're all talking to each other. Like Tracy showed you that network diagram. We have RMC communication between all the HMCs. That's how it knows where it's allocating or or deallocating uh, mobile activations, they all are made aware of any changes. So they all just got informed that we have a, a situation where we have four cores that are still 
uh, still running in a running partition, allocated to a running partition that we've told the Power Enterprise pool we want to have returned. So to rectify that, um, again, I did this allocation and before, on my partition. Let me jump in here. Before you rectify that, the, the cool thing about this compliance that we need to know here is that Alan took those four back. The pool got those four back, so you could actually assign you went back to eight, so you could give those four cores to another system. What happens is it starts a timer with that compliance. Once it sees that that happened, that you're approaching, it starts a clock that says that this system, you have 24, you have 48 hours to be able to get that unreturned back. So Alan goes in, he's gonna show you how that happens. But this compliance is important because a lot of people think, oh no, I'm in trouble, I'm gonna have a problem. You have 48 hours to fix it. Why did we do that? We did that so that if you're moving workloads between systems and you still need processor and memory on a VIOS server on system one, we don't take it away. We leave it there, let you put it over on system two and actually move your resources between the two systems. And then we expect you to, as Alan's gonna show you, remove those resources and come back in compliance. Sorry, Alan, but I wanted to make that point. A great point. In fact, I wish we had a third server in our pool so I could have actually done what Tracy just said. I returned those four cores to the pool. I have eight cores I could have assigned to a third uh, server in the pool. Um, so excellent point, Tracy, thank you. Uh, so this is again, this is the partition that I assigned those additional cores to. If I wanna go in and look at his uh, partition properties, um, this is where it was kind of slow coming back to me. Um, so it does show that I have 20 cores allocated now. And I want to take that back down to, to what I originally had. So I'm going to take it back down to 15. So this is a DL par operation. This is just the, the new panel look and, and feel. Um, so from classic, it would be listed as a DL par operation. Here it's just listed as a uh, uh, processor memory uh, movement. So if I do a save on that, it's going to deallocate five processors from this running partition. Um, and that's usually pretty quick. So it completed that process. Um, so if we uh, go ahead and go back to my um, running system, what should happen here in a moment, if we go in and look at uh, my Power Enterprise pools, we should see that uh, they've been returned. And I will, in a moment or two, I should get a message saying that I am back into a compliance. There it is, there's my messages. So each server, each uh, HMC, I should say, in the, uh, in the system is going to get the messages that mobile cores have been successfully reclaimed. And they're also going to get this message here that, HS, uh, um, that all return mobile cores have been reclaimed for, uh, that's not the one I'm looking for. This is the one I'm looking for. So this is, the pool is back in compliance. <clears throat> so with that, we've just demonstrated how easy it is to take mobile activations, assign those mobile activations to one of the servers in the pool, to allocate those newly available processors to a partition running on that server, and this is a good point, time to mention that Tracy already mentioned shared processor pools. Mobile activations are always assigned to the default share pool. So if you're a partition that you want to be able to utilize these additional cores that are available now after the mobile activations are running in a, uh, a separate share pool, I would need to go into that separate share pool and say increase my max to accommodate those additional five cores as, a, as, a, as occurred in this case, or four cores actually, um, before I could then assign them to a partition running in that uh, separate share pool. Um, and then we demonstrated the uh, condition where I've returned processors in this example back to the pool, but those could not be returned physically to the pool until I released them from the running partition. So that generated that temporary compliance situation with four unreturned cores. And we uh, reconciled that by releasing those cores from the running partition, thereby allowing the enterprise pool to reallocate, fully reallocate those uh, four cores for uh, reassignment and to uh, eliminate that compliance issue. 
So that concludes my demo. And uh, Tracy, one. are you going to pick up again? I'm hoping that you guys are seeing it. You guys see, Joe, are we back on the right screen? Every, every no, managing agency. I'm going to stop showing. Yep. yep, back on your screen, Tracy. You're back on mine, right? Yeah, okay. we're back on yeah, your so screen. Just, th thanks, Alan. That was a good demo. And I, I'm going to pick up on a few things that Alan said. So at the end of that, if you went back, and this is one of the last screenshots that Alan had where he's showing you those error messages, you'd also see where we saw those four unreturned. You'd see now those are no, it goes back to zero and we go back to four and you see compliance. So a couple more things on compliance. What compliance does is there's two levels of compliance and the details are in the info center. I'll point to that in a bit here on some slides in the back of here. Um, but compliance has first the server. So we give you 48 hours to get the server back in compliance. If you didn't get the server back in compliance, then the pool starts the next level of being out of compliance is at the pool level. And you have another 48 hours to get the pool back into compliance. So what it means is after 96 hours, if you haven't fixed the situation, we won't let you move mobile activations around until you fix the server that had the situation. And you saw in, in Alan's demo how he could do that. You have to, in essence, you have to take those resources back. We don't automatically take them back from a running LPAR or a running system. We need you to make that decision to pull those processors and those memory activations so that now we can then say, take those mobile activations back. So a couple of slides here. I don't want to go into crazy detail, but what this, what's in the XML file? First off, it's signed, so it's a secure signature sign. You can't go in and hack your XML and get it to work. And what I want to show you is this kind of gives you some details of what's in the XML. But what I did is I took a, one of one, an XML file. I used to do this for people all the time. I'd get in their XML file and I would highlight the things in the XML file. So if you open up your XML file, and I'll show you in a minute where you get it. But if you went in, every every customer gets a unique pool number. Here you can see this one's uh, 0363. It always has a sequence number. So the first time you get an XML, it's sequence one. If I went in and added another system, um, I would see sequence two. So I can always tell, and on the HMC, we can look at the, the prop, general properties of the pool and it'll tell you what sequence number is actually loaded on the system. It won't let you back level to an earlier sequence. So you always are stepping that to the next number. And I put a lot of details in here. So what you'll see is the pool ID, the sequence number, then you'll see if you have memory. In essence, this code has a memory resource entitlement, then it has a memory, the end of that particular string. And you see what happens. We pick one of the um, we pick one of the systems. In this case, we pick this particular system, and um, this system is what we're assigning this to. It really doesn't matter. It's just one of the systems on the definition. And in there, if you go up into that field and you go across as we count here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, three tells me the number in decimal. How many how many increments of mobile do I have? So three times a hundred. This pool would have 300 gigabytes of mobile memory activation. If I went down to the processor field, here you can see I caught a same count across 22. So the number of systems I have in this particular pool, I can spread 22 mobile cores across any of those machines. Um, I don't have to be connected to these machines to be able to have this 22. The 22 has been defined. Then what happens is we have the start of the members of the pool. And this one, you can see it had two members in it. Right. So again, high level, that's what you see in an XML. And again, I don't need to go into these. This is stuff you don't need to know until you're ready to know. And when you want, then when you're there, these are the screens you'll want to reference. The next one is I just added this one because to do that auto conversion I talked about earlier, if you have the right, if you have the right firmware and the right HMC code, you have this ability then to add these feature codes, the EME. What it would do is add another field to that XML file I was just showing you. And in here, you could go in and say, okay, here it is for memory and here it is for processor. The next field, where do I get the XML file? Well, on 54, this is the URL you go to. And in here, you specify your machine type uh, model down below, machine type serial number. And you can see the download config file. So if I went out there and did a uh, pull down, I'd see various ones that I might be looking at to help clients with. Um, but again, you can see that in there. And here's just a, another kind of sh shot on that, because when I pick this field here, download config file, I get to another screen. The screen I have to put in this information, submit it. 
And then what will happen is I have the ability to see that I can actually download that XML file to my device that I'm using, in this case, maybe my laptop. And then what I'll do is actually take that, and when I'm on the HMC running, you know, the web interface from my PC, I can upload that to the HMC, or you could FTP it, whatever method you use to get content to your HMC. And then I would go in and say, um, and I didn't put it in this slide deck, but I could go through a whole sequence of creating a uh, creating the pool. And it's fairly easy to create a pool, very straightforward. The slides uh, in the Info Center are pretty good on this. In this case here, so I'm showing you the download file. I can see that there's one there. I can see the pool ID for this one, and I can say download the file, and down it comes. Um, here I'm just showing an example. If you were on that site and you had multiple, maybe somebody did something to this system where they changed the vet code, they added something, or they did something and increased the, the static memory on demand. Again, these are different um, codes, the COD codes are, that you may see on a given system serial number. Just some of those examples. Another screenshot here as well. So after initial setup of the master console, you see something like this. This is what Alan was showing you on ours. And these screenshots you pretty much went through. Um, I don't think I'm gonna add anything else to these except for just kind of roll. This is what I wanted you to see though. Um, Alan showed this, he showed the available, and when you were looking at it, um, you saw it was one, and then when he did the mobile, it went to five. You can see how many are signed. What I wanna show you, how many are configurable and installed, but here, I want you to know that if you go to processor and you look at the, and I need to update these, update these slides from the classic to the new uh, enterprise GUI. But um, again, if you look at view the capacity, this is a good place for you to look at, because if you're wondering from early on when I said you could turn on processors in various ways, this is an example of this particular machine has 28 active. You can see how they came on. So those were all, you know, we can see those were static, and I can see I've got one mobile here. But if I had a combination of different ones, whether it was elastic or trial, you know, the, these would show me how those, how those 28 or um, how my, how many of these processors, this way, 28 and one temporary. So this shows you how to understand how those processors were activated. Again, just some more back to that same screen. Um, and here is what I was telling you. I, I couldn't remember if I left this in here. Here's the general property. You can see we're on sequence 41 on this one. You can see my pool ID. And this is kind of where you can tell which machine is master, although you, know, you saw that pretty well in terms of what Alan was showing you through the new interface. Um, here's where I would go if I want to go look at the uh, Knowledge Center. The full deck that I'd send out to people, this, this guy has now, it's got about 145 slides in it. I knew we wouldn't get through 145, so I kind of condensed some of the main points that I wanted to make with you guys. Um, and this just talks about if you were looking at what's been going on on your machine in your pool, this is a good place to look, view the, the pool history. I also didn't include any of the uh, CLI, because you can go down into the CLI interface and do a lot of this through command. This is just doing it all, demoing it. What we did was through the GUI. But again, here you can see the log of what's been going on on the system. Now, you know, uh, I was we're recently working earlier this year with someone, and they were trying to DL power memory off of the system, and they got really nervous because what had happened was they wanted to take the memory off and give it to another system, but the system was getting those error messages like Alan was showing you for processor. Same thing, where I'm now entering out of compliance because the memory hasn't come back. And the memory hasn't come back because I'm still consuming it. So it took some time to bring memory back. And this is where we'll talk here in a minute where I want to point out this eight, well, here it is. I didn't realize I had it on the next screen. The 860, what I wanted you to see in 860, this is what every firmware release, there's enhancements in here. And actually this is an excellent, you guys did the announcement letters, but this middle one, this development wiki is one you guys want to keep around. This will actually launch you if you want to find out what's going on on PowerVM firmware, this is one you guys can look at, and it will show you any update that development is doing. This is a place where you as clients can do Q&A and things back and forth with development. But in here, you can see kind of some of the areas that they're working on. So this is a great reference, and this is actually where I pulled this next slide out. Because notice, oh, let me just jump back one. Notice I put improved performance on dynamic LPAR memory. And I know the lead developer here, we were talking about this, and this was just like big. 
it, it really helps us because notice here um, to DL par add a memory to a, a partition. It goes through some of the different blockings and what we have for blocking sizes that you define down in ASMI based on the amount of uh, memory you have installed in your system. But what they've been able to do is this method that they change, this algorithm, this overlapping and multiprocessing of these requests has resulted in up to a 70% reduction in the time to add memory to a partition. This is huge. The DL par, this is another one down here at the bottom. Again, you guys can read this at your leisure, but notice they've observed elapsed performance increases from three to 200 times with this latest for removing memory from a partition. So these are some big benefits with the 860 firmware. <coughs> and just to kind of wrap this up so we can hit our time here, this just is, a, again, a link to the Knowledge Center, which has a lot of what we were talking about in it. And last but not least here, as we kind of round this out, um, it's really important, anybody that's buying these high-end systems, we work very closely uh, with, with the lab services team. Mike and Gary do an awesome job out with clients, and there's several other guys now that are doing this as well, um, along with Bob, in terms of delivering any of these types of services. And again, here's an a ID that you can send in as clients to ask for some additional assistance. Um, and here are just some additional links. And with that, I thank you. And what I put on the last couple slides you guys have, this was our 870 and 880. This is what a system node would look like. And this is what the C models would look like. So with that, I don't know, Joe, if we have some questions, we, in the amount of few minutes we have left, um, but I'm yeah, more than happy uh, Tracy, to Yeah, Tracy, we do have some questions. questions. Um, yeah, we, ha we have some questions, and, and, you know, I've been answering them, and actually Tom Prokop's joined, and he's been answering some in the background as well, so, but um, but there are a few that aren't answered here, so so let me throw a couple out to you, okay? Um, what about IFL cores? So the question is, is it still true that IFL cores don't participate in the PEP? That it, um, can you move those? Yeah, so an excellent question. IFL is because of the price point they're at. Um, we typically, they, they have not been included as part of moving those around. What we talk about, the movement that we're moving around is what we refer to as general purpose activations, which will be the ones for the, you know, when you're running um, general purpose are activations for IBM I, AIX, not that you can't use them for Linux, but these, these Linux uh, only IFLs, we do not support them in a, in a pool. Okay. So, um, you know, you mentioned a little bit about licenses moving, um, Tracy. Could you talk a little bit more about, you know, so how it works? So I, ha I have AIX and I have IBM I and, and maybe I have Linux running on some cores too. And I want to move some mobile activations um, from around. And, and let's just say I want to move my IBM I workload. How, I know the IBM I licenses move. How is all that handled as far as the background and making sure this is what I want to move versus, you know, something else? So, so today what happens is, um, just like with CBUs, there's terms and conditions. We don't have actual monitors in here at this point in time. It's certainly a discussion we've had for future to actually, what would be nice if I could have on my HMC, if I knew I had a, a pool of systems, let's just say I had five systems, and I had 50 IBM I license across those, what would be nice is if I could move my IBM license to any one of those systems, and actually part of my pool management was also knowing that I wasn't over consuming uh, resources. We do not have that today. What we have today is part of the terms and conditions with Power Enterprise pool. Let's just say I was running uh, an IBM I workload on a 795 and that particular system was part of mobile and I had 10 processors that I, and I licensed 10 IBM I cores worth of capacity on that 795. Well, if I wanted to move that Let's just say I was using PowerHA as an example, and I moved it from the 795 to the 880. Well, when I moved those processors and or memory activations, the processor activations are really where the licenses are tied to. And what happens is we allow clients to have, as long as you don't um, overutilize your license. So let's just say in this example, I have 10 H IBM I license on the 795. I moved them to the 880. Those 10 licenses for the IBM software move with me, and that would be the IBM I license entitlement along with the Power VM and license entitlement. If I was using Power VC 
if I was using Power HA. So in essence, what happens, you have to look across the pool and get an idea of how many licenses of IBM I, AIX, and other IBM license you have, and then the ability to move those between systems um, is part of the T's and C's with the Power Enterprise pool. And that's, that's in the licensing agreement, part of the contractual stuff that I had talked about in the process earlier. So hopefully that helps. Um, and if there's more, you know, on that, we can certainly follow up with um, whoever's asking. Um, again, hopefully that helps. Back to you, Joe. Okay. So um, let me throw another one at you, Tracy. You talked a little bit about when you're moving these licenses and what, what cores are active and uh, um, optimization and stuff like that. So um, the question is, and um, what what is it about the Numa Nuka optimization after after the workload is moved? So it, does the hypervisor, so the question goes on, is, does the hypervisor just take care of that or is there some manual optimization that needs to be done? And I just thought I'd let you talk about that a little bit. Okay, yeah, so this this gets into another area beyond Power Enterprise Pool, but, you know, certainly one that I that I work on and worry about and why we have Power VP. Um, one of the things that we really, Power VP came around, the virtual processor came around mainly because of Power 7, and Power 7, we had multiple three hops. We didn't have as good of performance between nodes, so um, which which processor activations were lit up could affect performance some more than what they do in Power 8. With Power 8, where we actually now have um, the fabric, where instead of having three hops, we have two hops. Um, we also have preferred and, and uh, detour routes, if you will, for getting content. So it's not the, the actual placement uh, for performance of which cores I light up um, aren't as, as important as they once were. But again, with that said, if I want to optimize the system, so a lot of times, one of the things we would say, why do I have, and the slides that I built and gave to Steve, were around this whole, um, one of the reasons would be I move a workload from system one to system two, I light up cores on system two. When I come back to system one, depending on what I've been doing, the cores that used to be my home cores, somebody else might be using. So as much as I want to use those same cores, I might not be able to for a while. So there are cases where we still can do, and again, with Power VP, you can do a Power VP um, analysis which is in essence, again, the way I used to describe this, it's kind of like if you go to your PC and you say, let me go run the defrag and see if I think I need to defrag my disk. You can do that with Power VP and get an idea of if it thinks that, you know, after you've moved the workload, that it, it's going to matter a lot that whether you need to do a Power VP and re, reshuffle the LPARs or not. I don't see too many people worrying about that in Power 8 enterprise systems. Not to say that it's not part of the, the discussion that I have on architecting and best practices on enterprise systems, but I don't see the need for it as much, but it is something if you want the optimal performance, you may consider doing Power VP. And again, looking at that and perhaps running that on an off hour to re-optimize uh, potentially, because sometimes these are critical workloads that we want best performance on. Hopefully that helps. Yep. Okay. Thanks a lot, Tracy. And, and we're out of time now, so we're going to end here. I know Alan had to uh, drop off. He's doing a, a lunch and learn for another customer that just started a couple minutes ago, so he already dropped off. But um, thanks to him and thanks to you, Tracy, for, for putting all these uh, slides together and, and uh, helping to share all this knowledge with our customers um, out there. So appreciate it. Thanks everyone for joining. Awesome. I'll be sending out um, invites for next month soon. Uh, we've got a, a great topic for next month, so it's going to have to be a surprise for you until I get the invite out. But uh, appreciate it, and uh, y'all have a good month and a good spring. Thanks, Joe. Yep. Bye, Tracy.